Okay, hey folks, Mark Locklear here uh, with a quick screencast on part two, the second part of chapter 12. And today I'm going to talk about uh, searching and sorting algorithms, and then we'll also look at two-dimensional arrays. I'm just going to say a few thoughts on those. Um, not, not really going to code, um, not going to do any coding exercises here. Uh, I'll just let the... Um, I'll just let the coding exercises stand on their own. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, so with that being said, let's um, share my screen. Okay, so let's back up here. All righty, so let's talk about searching first. So first off, before we go too deep into, into these, so these algorithms are all, um, the interesting thing about all of these algorithms, the searching and the sorting, is that you can use these in any programming language. So this is not just a C++ thing. So think about this, especially if you go on to do great things in software development, that uh, these, Algorithms are ubiquitous across across programming languages. So you'll find a bubble sort in any programming language. You'll find a selection sort. I think those are the two of the book covers. We're going to only talk about the bubble sort, and then um, and then also these. We're going to look at linear and um, um, linear and binary searches. And so the cool thing about doing this with C++ the way we're doing it is we're really getting down. It's all just loops and variables here. I mean you're passing an array of elements. And then you're, you know, you've got some logic you're applying to all, all of these. So I, I think it's neat that, uh, you know, think about this in terms of a bigger sort of software development thing and not necessarily a, a C++ thing. So, okay, so let's talk about a linear search first. So linear search is really a, a really basic search. Essentially, all you're doing is just what it says. It's linear in that you start at the beginning and you're just going and looking through, you know, looking, searching through an array for a given value. So in this case, uh, you notice we've got one, you know, the, the element uh, or you've got an array um, called numbers here and it's got six elements in it, one, two, three, five, seven, and eleven. And essentially all it does is you're going to just loop through that, uh, loop through that array and look for the presence of that element. And if we look at it here, uh, they've created a, a method for it or a, a function for it, but essentially the function takes, and you've got a for loop here, and if the array in that given, uh, or if the element matches the value, this value defined, then you're gonna return, you know, you're gonna return that value. So linear search is probably the mo most basic kind of search there is. Now the downside of a linear search is, it can take a long time to do, right? I mean, again, we're just talking about six elements here, but imagine you have six million elements, and let's say the number you're looking for is the very last, the value you're looking for is the very last value in the, uh, in the array. Well, in that case, you know, you've got to search through the entire thing to find that one value. So, you know, the, the, the downside of a linear search, I mean, again, it's fairly straightforward. It's easy to implement, but it can be slow and uh, and it can be very inefficient. So let's look at an alternative to that. So an alternative to that would be a binary search. It's it's interesting as I was reading this, it just made me think about the guess value app. Remember you guys did a, a, a you guys wrote an app where you picked a random number to, from one to fifty. I can't remember if it was one to fifty or one through through ten. But you know when I was testing that, I often didn't know what the value was rather than displaying on the screen. And so having to do that, I, and I also did that for uh, for my Java class, I think too. But having done it so many times and having to run these programs and tests, I found personally I defaulted to a binary search. Now I'm not talking about an algorithm. I just mean I would say, okay, if one to fifty is what I'm searching for, I would start at twenty five would be my first guess. And th this is exactly what a binary search does. I start at twenty five because it's in the middle, and I can immediately with one um, you know, with with one check, I can narrow down whether the value is in the first half of the number set, one through 50, or is it in the second half? And then, so if the number was higher or lower, you know, if it was higher, let's say, then I would search one through 25. And, and I would generally pick a number halfway between there. So I'd pick like 15. And then if it was higher or lower. So essentially, you know, even though I wasn't thinking about it at the time, you know, binary search is what I was implementing with that. So 
uh, let's look at the way a binary search uh, works. So the caveat here is that a binary search needs to be sorted first, right? It doesn't really work, or at least it's not efficient uh, un unless the, um, the array has been sorted first, because once it's been sorted, then you can narrow down, okay, I can start halfway and I can know with certainty whether a given value is in the first half of the array or the second half. So you can see that's what we're do they're doing here. They got this first and uh, first and middle values. Uh, last is going to be size minus one. You remember uh, last uh, gives you the the position just after the last element in the array. So that's why you do that minus one. And then while first is less than last. Um, and then so you can see this middle essentially cuts it in half, it divides the array elements by, by two, and then sort of goes goes through and searches. So let's let's look at an example. Um, uh, an, an example. Well, sorry, I'm sorry. So that that's that's the that's that's the guts of a binary search and how how that that works. Uh, again, have to be sorted first. We're going to cut it in half, and then whether the value appears in that first half of the array, if, if we know it's not there, then we move to that half, we'll cut it in half each time. And so uh, you can see sort of how that shortens out, um, basically shortens the amount of times you have to search. Whereas with a linear search, you would just start from the front and move all, all the way through. So the book goes into more de detail about that. So you can read that there, but I just wanted to say a few words about it here. Okay, so let's look at a bubble sort our, our room. So here we're sorting, so the, the previous um, uh, the previous search algorithm we looked at with a binary search, I mentioned that the caveat was that it needed to be sorted first. So that begs the question: Well, how do you sort, or what's what's an efficient way to sort things? So I think the book covers two. It covers uh, the bubble sort and the selection sort. I'm just going to cover the bubble search sort here because it's probably a more popular one, or at least you hear about it more than you do a selection sort. And essentially, what's happening here is the this algorithm is going to loop through each element in the array. And it's essentially gonna sort in ascending order. So you want the smallest first. So essentially it's gonna look at each element and say, okay, if this element is bigger, the first element is bigger than the second element, then I'm gonna swap those. Okay, now let me start. And then and it moves through them that way. Okay, so the first and second, I'm gonna put the smaller element first if it needs to be swapped. The third and fourth, if the third is bigger than the fourth, I'll swap those. And it sort of moves through it that way. Then when it gets to 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 the end, it starts back at the beginning and continues to move through those. Uh, I'm not going to go into details on on the code here. Again, the book does a good job of of walking you through each sort of line here. But let's look at a um, good way to look at this is an example like this. And again, this is one that the book uses. But I, I just wanted to sort of talk you through it. So let's say our initial sequence here is two, seven, five, and one. Okay. So the first thing. The first thing this algorithm does is, okay, is two smaller than seven? Yep, it is. Okay, let's move on. Is seven smaller than five? And I'm looking at seven and five here. Nope, it's not. Okay, swap swap those. Okay, is seven, now that I've swapped five and uh, seven and five becomes five and seven. Now that I've swapped those, is seven smaller than one? Nope, okay, swap those. So now we end up, uh, after the first iteration through through the loop, we've got two, five, two, five, one, and seven. Now we're gonna start back from, from the beginning. Is two smaller than five? Yep, so I don't need to do anything there. Is five smaller than one? Nope, so swap those two. So that's where this swap happens. So now at the end of the second iteration, we've got two, one, five, and seven. And again, we're gonna start back, uh, start back over at the beginning. All right, is two smaller than one? No, so we're gonna swap those two. Now we're good to the rest of the way out, right? One is smaller than five, five is smaller than seven. So you end up with one, two, five, and seven. So that's just a little glimpse inside sorting and searching algorithms. Uh, again, I'm, I, I could talk all day uh, ab about those, but you're just gonna have to get in there for yourself and sort of read and again, definitely ask questions if you have them. Um, this is obviously very contrived. We're just looking at four elements in an array here. Again, you can imagine if you've got uh, a thousand, which is even a relatively small number, when you start to get into the, to the millions, 
uh, then you really see the power of these where you can really compare one sort of algorithm to another. And I mean, just think about Google and things like that. Think about all of the data that Google has, or even Facebook. When you go up to the search bar and you type in someone's name there, you know, Facebook's got over a million users now. I don't know that they may have a billion, but by this point, I'm not even sure how large they are. But, you know, you pretty quickly, when you type in, you know, the first three or four characters of somebody's name, you immediately get some results there. And think about the, the how vast the number of records is being searched there. And the way that they do that is by using algorithms like, like these, okay? Okay, let's talk about uh, two-dimensional arrays. So just as a review, uh, this is a basic built-in array that we're looking at here. And you can see, obviously, uh, you remember we start with zero, uh, always start counting the array where the element, the elements of an array is zero, and then just sort of work our way up. So in, 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 in this case, uh, we initialized an array called weak, and we know it's got seven elements in it. So again, zero, one, two, three, four, five, through, through six. So I just wanted to review that. Uh, before talking about two-dimensional arrays. So when we talk about two-dimensional arrays, uh, th this is a nice graphic representation of what a two-dimensional array looks like. Generally, you'll see this rows and columns um, sort of model or syntax that programming languages use, and this is common across all programming languages. Uh, I mean, you, you could call these, this row, this rows and calls here, you could call that foo and bar if you, you wanted to. Those are just names, but you know, for us human beings, that helps us uh, imagine, you know, rows going left to right and then columns, of course, going up, up and down. And so in this case, you know, you've got three rows here and of course, four columns across the top. When we're accessing arrays, and you'll see this in the homework, I'm having you watch a, a video and make, uh, 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 make a couple of of programs there that you're using characters there, I think, rather than numbers in both, both of those. But when we access these, uh, you should be familiar with this sort of single element access that we've done in the past with uh, single row arrays. But in this case, when we have two, uh, when, when we have two dimensional arrays, you use, you use these square brackets and you just use them twice following one another. The, the first one represents the row, the second one represents the column. So in this case, for instance, the zero, zero value is gonna be 89. And we can see that here. Again, zero going across here, and then coming down, you're in this zero, zero position. Another example here, one and three. So setting value to one and three to 100. And so this is row one. So again, we always start with zero, so zero, one. And then here, this is going to be uh, the three is actually going to be the fourth column, again, because we're starting with zero. So this hundred position would be here. And then there's an example of initializing a, a two-dimensional array down at the bottom. Um, so yeah. Um, so then, and then to process arrays, uh, you can always use this nested loop and the idea here is rows and you notice this is also handy when we're processing so the outer loop here this first for loop call that the outer loop is going to be looping through the rows so you're sort of sort of going through the rows that way and this inner loop is going to go through the columns so in that case you know you can imagine a scenario where you're starting in the first row and sort of moving left to right and sort of moving through all of those values and then um, here is output so you know, in this case, you can imagine a scenario with a two-dimensional array uh, where you've got three, in this case, we've got three, three students and then four, four scores per student. And then you're gonna get the average score. In this case, we're getting the average score for each student here. So, um, so yeah, for each, uh, for each uh, we're getting the, uh, each row represents a student, so you're going to get all the columns in that row, and then that's what's going to that's you're going to add those up, and then of course divide by four, and that's what's going to give you the average score for each of those students. Okay, that's all I'll say for now. Again, I could sort of talk and regurgitate what's in, inside the book, but I, I think uh, I think reading it for yourself and experiment within the code uh, with the code is going to be the best way for, for you to learn. So. As always, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Let me stop sharing here. 
Um, so we're doing this next week. So I think what we're going to do going forward is we're going to skip the uh, exceptions. I think that's what it is, um, the exceptions chapter. I really want to get an object-oriented program. And we've only got two weeks, maybe three weeks after that, after we do this week. So I really want to, uh, I really want to focus on object-oriented program. We'll, talk, we'll probably take two weeks for the, the object-oriented chapter two. So that's all for now. Uh, as always, let me know if you have questions. Thanks.